Hi! This is a pretty old one, but with my recent development of the Coriolis simulator, see my last livestream or the video before that, Eric E. suggested on Discord that I could address it. In the video, Brandon presents an example flight from Anchorage to Mexico City and shows that its path, which is roughly an orthodrome in the reference frame rotating with the Earth, is a weird spiral when viewed from an inertial reference frame. He does a pretty good job at transforming the path manually to the inertial reference frame as we will see. He then poses three questions. The first one is basically whether he's correct in thinking that the plane has to accelerate during the flight and that the engines need to provide more power near the end of the flight because of that. The second question is why the plane doesn't take the shortest path as viewed from the inertial frame. The third question is about the return journey and how it's shorter in the inertial frame, and so according to Brandon, it should use up less fuel. Let's take a look at some simulations and see what they let us figure out about this flight. Let's start with a simulated plane. We'll put it at 60 degrees north, 150 degrees west, which is close to Anchorage, and let it fly at 250 meters per second, which is 900 kilometers per hour, or about 560 miles per hour. The starting azimuth will be 116.5, which is the heading from Anchorage to Mexico City. Let's start with the simulation. And we can see that the plane flies towards Mexico while the Earth rotates, which we can see by looking at the sky. After some time, the plane reaches Mexico. I'll pause the simulation. I could run it and it would just keep flying forward as the simulation has no notion of when to end the flight. Let's take a look at what the path looks like in the inertial frame. Changing to the inertial frame, we see that it is indeed a spiral. And we see that moving forwards and backwards in time, the plane moves along this path while the Earth rotates. Let's compare that to the path that Brandon figured out manually, and we see that it's a pretty close match. Of course Brandon used just 5 points, while the simulator generated thousands of them, and so the simulated path is smoother, but that's just the advantage of using a computer. So that being said, we can say that the path Brandon showed is pretty much correct. So now to the questions, let's start with question 1. First, Brandon states that the Earth imparts 513 miles per hour on the plane. Looking at the speed in the rotating frame and in the inertial frame, we see that we have 250 meters per second in the rotating frame and 470 meters per second in the inertial frame. We can see the velocity vector changing while I am changing the reference frames. The difference, 220 meters per second, is not quite equal to the speed of the points of the surface here, because the velocity of the points on the surface is not parallel to the velocity of the plane relative to the surface, and so the magnitude of the vector sum of the velocities isn't equal to the sum of magnitudes. The magnitude of the vector difference would actually be closer to 230 meters per second, which is about 514 miles per hour, pretty much the value Brandon calculated. So we could say that this part is correct. In the second part, Brandon says that the plane must increase its quote-unquote speed in space. A better phrasing would be speed relative to the inertial frame, as there is no such thing as speed in space, but we can let this one slide. Let's look at what happens to the plane's speed in the simulation. As we said, the speed at the beginning is 470 meters per second in the inertial frame. At the end of the journey, that speed is 600 meters per second, or 130 meters per second more than at the beginning. So the plane did have to increase its speed relative to the inertial reference frame. How did it do it? Is it, like Brandon suggests, due to the engines providing more power? Well, no. The mistake here is assuming that the engine power required somehow reflects the speed relative to the inertial frame, but this is not so. The role of the engines in flight is to overcome drag. And drag depends on the relative speed of the plane and the air, not the speed relative to some abstract inertial reference frame. In the absence of wind, this speed of relative wind is the same as the speed relative to the surface. And the speed relative to the surface is 250 meters per second throughout the whole journey. 
The simulator shows 249.9, but this is just a numerical inaccuracy. So the engines didn't need to increase their thrust at any point. They only needed to provide enough thrust to overcome a constant 250 meters per second relative wind. Okay, but the plane did accelerate relative to the inertial frame. So where did that come from, if not from the engines? Well, in order to keep a straight ground track, the plane needs to correct for the Coriolis force. This is what the plane in the simulation does. It applies a force to the side, cancelling the horizontal component of Coriolis. If I turn on rendering the force vectors, you can see this force as the dark blue vector. And if we look from the rotating reference frame, you can also see Coriolis, the cyan vector, and the centrifugal force, the light green vector. Coriolis and centrifugal forces only appear in the rotating reference frame as they are inertial forces, and they depend on the reference frame. So how does a plane apply this Coriolis correction? Easy, by tilting the wings to the side. The Coriolis force always acts in the direction perpendicular to the velocity, so its horizontal component can only act to the right or to the left from the direction of motion. I'm specifying the horizontal component since generally they, there will also be a vertical component, responsible for a part of the Otfish effect. When the plane is tilted to the side, the lift generated by the wings no longer acts vertically. Rather, it has a vertical component and a horizontal component. The vertical component has to balance the effective gravity and the vertical component of Coriolis. Note, not exactly, but this topic is out of scope of this video. A small downwards force needs to be left so that the plane follows the curvature of the Earth, and that's the other part of the Erdfish effect. But let's leave it at that for now. The horizontal component, on the other hand, can balance the only other force acting in this direction, the horizontal component of Coriolis. If you have flown on a plane, you may be confused at this point. Wait, you might say, I've never noticed a plane tilting to the side. Does it mean there was no correction for Coriolis? The answer lies in how big this correction is. How much does the plane have to tilt to apply the necessary correction? Well, the simulator can show this value to us. It is between 0.18 and 0.07 degrees. It is simply small enough not to be noticeable. But wait, if it's so small, how can it make the plane gain so much speed? Is it that much though? It gains about 130 meters per second over 7 hours. That's less than 20 meters per second per hour on average, or 0 0.005 meters per second squared. It's less than one thousandth of a g. The Coriolis correction force is actually larger than this value, but it's because it isn't parallel to velocity. In the rotating frame it's always perpendicular to velocity, so it doesn't change the speed at all. In the inertial frame, however, the velocity has a slightly different direction, and so this force, which is in the same direction, has a component parallel to it. It is this component that is responsible for the change in speed. What if the plane did not correct for Coriolis? We can actually see in the simulator. We can add an object that will start in the same direction, with the same speed as the plane, but it will then move without this correction. Let's run the simulation with that. And we can see that it gets quickly deflected by the Coriolis force. And when the plane reaches Mexico City, the non-correcting object is somewhere near Hawaii. So the Coriolis correction, while small, can add up to a large effect over bigger timescales. Now, if we look at that non-correcting object in the inertial frame, we can see that its speed actually decreases. It might seem weird because why would it decrease if no force is acting on it in the horizontal direction? But a full explanation is beyond the scope of this video. For now, let me just say that this is expected and is due to the conservation of angular momentum and the oblateness of the Earth. Note that the speed is again a constant 250 meters per second in the rotating frame. Well, the simulator shows 249.9, like before, but again it's just a numerical inaccuracy. So, to sum up the answer to the first question, Yes, the Earth does give the plane some starting momentum in the inertial frame. Yes, the plane has to increase its speed relative to the inertial frame. No, this isn't coming from the engines. The acceleration comes from the correction for Coriolis, which is perpendicular to the velocity vector in the rotating frame, 
but not perpendicular in the inertial frame, and so it can, and does, change the velocity in the inertial frame. On to question 2. As we have seen, the route taken by the plane is not the shortest one when viewed from the inertial frame. So would it be more efficient to take the shorter one? In short, yes if there was no atmosphere and no friction. In such a case it would make sense to launch directly in the direction of where the destination will be in the inertial frame. Then, during the whole cruise, no additional fuel would be needed. The vessel would just cruise with the momentum it got initially and arrive at the destination without thrusting on the way. And this is precisely how suborbital flights work. An object performing a suborbital flight, like an intercontinental ballistic missile, would be launched in such a direction that the resulting trajectory would leave the atmosphere and make the object re-enter it somewhere close to the destination. It would look something like this. I've added friction here so that the object will stop shortly after hitting the surface. You can see that this hits roughly Mexico City and that if we look from the initial frame of reference, the target seems to rotate into place. This doesn't really work for planes though. Planes move within the atmosphere, and using their engines they keep a constant speed relative to the air. So the optimal path for a plane is one that is shortest in the reference frame of the air, which, in the absence of wind, is identical to the reference frame of the surface. Flying along a path that is not a great circle on the surface, while keeping a constant speed relative to the surface, would mean flying longer because it would be a longer path traveled with the same speed. And that also answers question 3. It doesn't matter that the path relative to the initial frame is short. The optimal one is still the one that is a great circle relative to the rotating frame. To reiterate, the path as viewed from the initial frame is irrelevant, because what is important for flying the plane is the speed relative to the air. That is what directly affects aerodynamics, fuel consumption, etc. The inertial frame is only an abstract frame that can be used for describing the motion, but is useless for flight planning. I hope my answers have been satisfactory. If something was unclear, feel free to ask in the comments or come have a chat on my Discord. But for now, that is all. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.